All right. Well, um, look, let's see. Uh, let's see if people. Uh, let's see if more people jump in. But I mean, fundamentally, like we just wanted to start uh, talking, start talking to the community, and uh, yeah, I think this is going. We're going to turn this into a more regular thing, and it's an opportunity to ask questions. We will answer them. Hey, Hassan, good to good to have you joining. Um, and we'll uh, we'll answer questions. So you know, this isn't going to be super formal. Um, you know, it's not going to be really curated. Just, just think of it as a, as a, as an interactive way of chatting to the Snowplow team, and we'll make sure to sort of vary things up from our end and have different people joining, and uh, so you don't get, kind of get sick of sick of our voices. Um, as a kind of a couple of other things, so um, we'll we've obviously got the virtual event series. That's a, a much more sort of structured set of, of thinking from Snowplow. Definitely recommend um, checking that out. And we'll try and bring back the Snowplow meetups. Um, at some point as well. So we were we were hoping to kind of step up and, and do more of our, our meetups this year. But then, of course, uh, the novel coronavirus hit. Um, but we're, we're, we're thinking about that. We might we might come up with a kind of a virtual meetup format. But but in the meantime, we've, we've got this uh, got this going and we'll we'll aim to do another of these um, probably um, probably in a few weeks and with a with a more kind of US friendly time zone. But but we wanted to do it at this time because we've got, um, got some people like Rob joining from uh, from Australia. Um, so, uh, intros, I failed to do intros. I'm, I'm Alex, uh, one of the two co-founders of, of Snowplow and the CEO. Uh, does everyone, anyone at Snowplow, just, just shout out who you are and, 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 and what you do and, uh, go for it. Uh, I'm Josh. I'm the technical operations lead at Snowplow. Um, responsible for kind of running the, the infrastructure um, behind our managed service. Uh, hi, I'm Cara. I'm a product manager at Snowplow and have previously led the implementation engineering team. And I'm Steve. I'm VP Engineering. Uh, I support the work, um, the great work that we see in, the, in both our team and uh, at Snowplow and also in the community. And there's a lot of it at the moment. So I'm really pleased to get, get these sessions going and hear more from the community and to have the opportunity to share some of the things we're doing as well. Cool. Sophie, don't be shy. Hello. <laughs> uh, so I'm Sophie. I look after the events we do at Snowplow. Um, I'm just in the background making sure everything uh, is running smoothly, which it is. So yeah, excited to see you all. Sophie's here ready to take over if I press the wrong button. <laughs> Thank you, Sophie. <laughs> uh, cool. Steve, Steve we've, got, we've got some questions to go through. Yeah, so I wanted to talk um, a little bit first about why why do this session and why do it now. There's there's a lot of activity in the community right now. We've noticed that Discord is really busy. We're getting some really exciting contributions coming in on GitHub as well. We've also got some really big changes coming up that that uh, we want to we want to connect to the community and make sure that that we we have eyes eyes and ears uh, on it so so you can help us to push them forward. So we have uh, some work that we've been working on for a long long time. Um, uh, the failed events work that, that no doubt you'd have seen us talking about as the R one eighteen visa went out um, a couple of months back. We've been working on refining R one nineteen. I think it's actually the code's been released, but we're we're yet to announce. Um, so that's a, a little bit of a first here. That's that's been a, a really interesting project for us. It's it's been something that we've been talking about for a couple of years. It's been something that we've been working on for a couple of years. It's a new format code refactor, a lot more testing in there. Um, it, it's it's going to be a really big change for us. And there's some other big changes wrapped up in there as well around breaking up the mono repo and um, making it so that we, easy, we make it easier for us to ship faster and get changes in your hands as quickly as possible. We've got some great work in progress at the moment around some other interesting projects too. And also uh, tracker refactors on, on our most popular trackers, JavaScript, iOS, Android, and making them easier for the community to contribute to. And, uh, it's it's a great time more than ever with everything that's happening in the world to keep in touch and to to share this information and to um, you know see see what's happening out there in the community as well and as Alex says we'll we'll revive the meetups when we can but this is a great uh, a great interim for us so we put out a call for questions if this seems a little bit rough around the edges and a bit rushed it's because it is it is rushed um, we we put out a, a a form to try and capture some questions we got some great questions through that we just didn't want to hesitate on. So I got in touch with, with uh, the question askers, asked them to uh, when they might be available, uh, which is the reason why, um, by the way, that we're, we're broadcasting this uh, at this time and, and apologies to, to people in America's time zone. We, we will make the, the next one um, in, in, uh, at a more convenient time for you. 
Uh, but so yeah, we put out the, the call for questions, got some great ones through, didn't want to hesitate, picked a date and then thought, okay, so how, how are we going to run this thing? So if it's a bit rough around the edges, um, that's why, but uh, we, we've got lots of uh, interesting questions in. So, so without further delay, um, just to, to throw over to Rob, who, who sent us uh, a great question. Rob, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself a little bit and um, asking again your question. And uh, I know Cara has been thinking about this one. Oh, hey. Uh Thanks for having me on. Um, I guess, uh, you know, I'm, I'm Rob, I work at Mint Metrics. We do, we've been using Snowplow for a, for a number of years now. Um, it's a fairly like, uh, fairly ingrained tool in our business and we use it for reporting on experiments. And over the years, we've, we've made a heavy use of uh, the Redshift pipeline and where we've, we've got a, a big query and uh, Google uh, GCP pipeline up and running. Uh, and what, what, one of the, the, the big issues we're facing at the moment is how, how we go about performing our data modeling in, inside, of, uh, uh, the, inside of BigQuery. Awesome. Uh, I can take this one. Um, so I'm guessing on, on Redshift, have you taken a look at our web data model? Uh, yes, so we've got a fairly, uh, We've got a, a, a web data model uh, similar to that, but uh, uh, we've written it bespoke. So it's uh, si it's similar in that uh, we we generate like a page views table, um, and then uh, we've got a tra traffic sources table. Uh, we join that all together, uh, and we use that as uh, you know in some in some of our reports. Um, but then we've also got uh, a, I guess several other other tables that we build straight off Atomic dot events like. Uh, we've got um, our conversions tables and things as well. So it's quite a few different different steps. Maybe not your, your typical uh, your your typical um, web data model. That makes sense. Um, and <clears throat> yeah, and, and, and first off, we we definitely need to um, concede that the current state of that web data model repo. Uh, is, is, is a bit of shambles <laughs> and we're, we're in the process of tidying that up at the moment. So currently in there we only have a, a drop and recompute version of like a standard web model for Redshift which basically computes a set of derived tables, page views, sessions and users. So basically at three levels of the hierarchy um, and that's kind of all we've provided. Um, and towards the end of last year we really realized that that's actually like not enough to get people started, especially with the new warehouse that we have, Snowflake and, and BigQuery, um, but also with the increasing complexity of what people are using Snowplow for. Like we've had a lot of contributions, as as Steve said, in on the tracker side of things. Like we're working on a lot more of the different trackers, and so we want to kind of extend our data modeling out to more different um, databases and or also more different use cases. Um, so the first thing we're doing, and we have. Uh, kind of prepared an internal version of this and now and are working on the open source release to be released by the end of the quarter on a new incremental model for both, uh, for all three Redshift, Snowflake and BigQuery um, that computes these same three tables, page view sessions and users, um, but does so incrementally. And that incremental logic is based um, on how the data warehouses work. So for example, uh, in Redshift, um, because you pay kind of the storage and the computers more combined, <clears throat> The, the way we scan there will be different to in BigQuery where obviously you pay exactly how much data you scan. Um, so we've taken those nuances for the different data warehouses into account. Um, and the idea is that really the page view sessions and users tables um, serve more as blueprints for how to think about tables at these three levels of the hierarchy. And so if you think about the page views table, that's kind of like a, uh, an event level table. <clears throat> so a user does a page view, there might be some subsequent events on that page. But really, it's like a, a, an event level table, uh, just slightly more aggregated than the, the atomic events. Um, a sessions table then is, is really more at the level of a cycle. So you're looking at a given entity over a given period of time. So with a session, it's normally um, resets after 30 minutes of an activity, but you might have other types of, of cycle tables uh, where you're looking at a given entity over a specific amount of time. Uh, and then the user level table is really there to, to help you understand how you can build a table at like an entity level. So something that persists throughout history, like a user or a product or an article, something that is, is always there. 
um, and again, how there you aggregate and especially how do you aggregate efficiently in an incremental model. So obviously how you have to look back um, will be very different for a page view versus for a user because a user can come back again and again over time versus a page view like after a day you can kind of assume that page view is probably done. So there's differences in, in how you look back, there's differences in how you increment the table and of course those are much more important to consider in warehouses like Snowflake and BigQuery where you get billed on your usage of the, the data uh, versus in Redshift, but of course also in Redshift, um, we want to make things as efficient as possible. Um, and so that's what we've been, been working on. Uh, given that you've uh, asked this question, we have our internal um, version of the BigQuery model ready. Um, that's kind of like, we've called this a version 0.9 uh, because we still have some ironing out to do, but we'd be super happy to share this with you early uh, and if anyone else wants to have a look at this early, they can reach out, but we will be doing a proper open source release uh, of version one towards the end of the quarter. Um, and then um, we'll be building on that. Um, and so that's kind of the first thing we've done. Um, and then the, the next thing we're working on is, is helping uh, people make additive changes to these models. So building out templates um, to add, as you, for example, said, you've got traffic sources table that you kind of join with the, the page views table doing these kind of additive things rather than mutating the, the underlying tables um, will help us um, as we make changes, make those accessible easily to everybody who's using these models while still giving people the flexibility to add lots of custom things to these models. Um, so we'll both be working on, uh, we'll, uh, through the course of this year, we'll be releasing a lot more standard models uh, into open source, but also ways of making those standard models customizable, um, all of which for all three data warehouses and all of which incremental to make sure we're not making super inefficient <laughs> cloud bills. So, um, yeah, but as I said, we'll, we'll, we can share the, the internal version with you early and would love some feedback, um, but an open source release of this is coming at the end of the quarter. Cool. Yeah, I'd love to, love, to give that a give, love to give it a crack. Um, I guess uh, just as a, a bit of a follow-up uh, so to, to, to that. So in, in terms of the process of building out these, these data models, uh, uh, moving from the, the red, old Redshift model where we where we basically have SQL runner running as part of our batch pipeline each morning, uh, is there is there a similar similar uh, process for, uh, for, for for building building out your data models uh, in in as as you would as you would perform in in the, the batch pipeline? Yeah, so um, I mean, for our for our customers, we run um, SQL Runner for all pipelines. So whether it's GCP or, or AWS, um, so we we typically run them a little bit more frequently. Um, but again, this depends on like how efficient your model is. So like that's where the incremental nature is really really important. Um, so running it every hour, every half hour, every fifteen minutes. Um, and so we like yeah, we definitely recommend um, using SQL Runner also on GCP. Um, we've also seen a lot of adoption in the community of tools like dbt. I know they also have um, Snowplow blocks. Um, however, I think one thing that is always just important to, to think about is how, how you keep the manifest on anything incremental, especially if you want to run it again and again throughout the day, making sure that you're not scanning the same data again and again, uh, thinking about how you kind of set up that part is, is probably the most important part, but yeah. In terms of more generally running it, um, SQL Runner is, is definitely also a good option on GCP. Um, Josh, I don't know if you want to, to add anything to that. No, I think, uh, I think that covers everything. Cool, cool. Cheers. Um, and sorry, just one, one, other, like one other final point to that. So uh, in terms of the, the performance, so uh, we, we also tend to use a, um, uh, uh, superset for, for like dashboarding, visualization, and uh, collaboration. What, it, like, Redshift tends to be quite quite good performance-wise, where you can uh, query it interactively and and use it for dashboards. Uh, what about uh, what about maintaining um, uh, tables in in, in BigQuery uh, for use in like uh, uh, like superset? Is it is it fast enough to interactively query and, and use in a web interface like that? I mean, I'll, I'll let Josh speak to the, the infra side of things, but just from like a, 
modeling perspective, I think it's important to think about again, like how the different databases interact and like how you would set up the tables. So in Redshift, because obviously the more tables you save, the more you kind of take up space. And it's often nicer to have slightly less aggregated tables and do more of the aggregation in the queries that come from the BI tool. So in, in your case, superset. Um, versus on GCP, we've seen a few of our customers actually make more um, more aggregate tables. So basically have more tables at each level of aggregation. So even higher than just kind of at level of an entity, but even say making monthly reporting type style tables already in, in BigQuery and then querying those directly just to one limit the amount of data that needs to be scanned. Um, and also because you're not paying as much directly for storing those tables. So it's more efficient to make more tables in the modeling and then use them, uh, use them like that from the BI tool. Um, but yeah, just from the... Yeah, uh, the, the main point I was going to add is that like BigQuery, definitely the performance would be there. Um, but the cost is that you'll need to scan that data every time you want to do any sort of, um, you know, pull out any of those insights in your dashboard. So Redshift, you can get away with it. You can have quite raw data. It'll take a bit longer, but you can you can do a lot of less upfront work. Um, BigQuery, you'll have to do a lot of that upfront work to stop the cost. The performance will be there. The cost is is what you'll pay for for not doing that upfront. Um, so that yeah, it depends on how much data there is, how much you're scanning. Um, but yeah, that's uh, that's the main things to watch out for. Cool, cool. Thanks, guys. That's really really uh, uh really clear. Thank you very much, Rob. Um, we'll move on to the next question that we received uh, in advance, and, and it was from uh, Dana Redenia, but I don't think Dana, uh, Dana's on the uh, attendees list at the moment. So uh, I'll ask a question for them. So Dana asked, any tips on mobile attribution? Are third party attributions the only way to fully stitch the data like adjust? Cara, I think another one for you. Sure. Um, so the, the short answer is yes. Um, you do need third party tools, um, but I can go into a little bit more detail why and how. Um, so I think the, the whole mobile attribution piece kind of rests on, on two concepts. It's one, the actual attribution. So looking at when, when someone sees an ad, what is, what's the device, what's the user? And then when someone does something in the app, what's the device, what's the user? Is it the same? Can we attribute these two? Um, and then there's the, the kind of deferred deep linking. So obviously you have the deep links that send people into an app directly into a place. And then you have deferred deep links where because someone doesn't have the app yet, they have to go to the app store, install it, and then they get sent into the place in the app that you want them to go. Um, and you do need, um, you need a deep link to identify um, where people are, are going. And then you need that attribution piece basically where from the ad that's, for example, in a social media platform into the app, you can check that that's actually the same user so you know exactly what, what ad they came from. Um, and especially for that attribution piece, um, you need to have an agreement with, um, with the social media platform, so with Facebook or, or LinkedIn, uh, et cetera, to um, be able to capture that information when people see um, that ad. Um, and so Facebook has their uh, mobile um, measurement partner program uh, and there's five companies in that program that offer kind of like a SaaS service um, for this type of attribution um, and typically those even though like the attribution piece and the deep linking piece is, is slightly separate most people do those together so you get a solution that provides you both the deep link and the attribution um, of of those two things so like checking who the user is in the ad and then who the user is in the app and then making that stitch um, so you do need one of these uh, tools that are part of the, the mobile measurement uh, partner program from Facebook uh, or similar if you do a lot of advertising on those platforms, which I'm guessing that's generally where those, those questions come from, because if you're just advertising on your own website or something, then of course it's very easy to identify uh, for you because you can, you can link people through. Um, and so the, the other part of, of the puzzle is though, if you are using Snowplow, and especially if you're maybe using our, our mobile SDKs, the iOS and the, the Android SDKs, um, you might still have the question, okay, so if I use something like Adjust or Apps Flyer or Branch um, to capture these app installs attributed, um, then I still want to have this with my in-app data from Snowplow. I don't just want to look at the, the Branch UI or the Apps Flyer UI and like that will tell me how many 
um, attributed installs I've had, but I also want to know, okay, once these users have installed the app, like how many of these have I retained two months later? How many of these did the five things that I want people to do in my app in the first week, et cetera. Um, and that's where we recommend using our, uh, our webhook adapter. Um, so we've um, got something called the, the Igloo webhook adapter, which allows you to um, define a, a custom uh, schema, just like for the, our custom self-describing events or context. Um, and with this schema, this adapter will take any third party JSON and transform it into a Snowplow event. And it's very easy to set that up in those tools UIs, like enabling the data streams, like all of them support that. Um, and then you can basically send it to that endpoint uh, on the Snowplow collector. You define the schema, and for most of them, we have out of the box schemas already. So for adjust um, apps, flyer and branch, we do. Um, but of course, you can also make a custom one if you want to send any custom properties with these install events. Um, and then you, you using that adapter, you can basically transform all of these events into Snowplow events, send them into your atomic events table alongside all of your app data, your web data, any other data you have. Um, and that means like that attribution data can actually feed into your entire customer journey rather than just having it separate. Um, so, so kind of going back to the question, yes, you do need a third party tool, but if you are using Snowplow, we would recommend you, you send that data from the third party tool into Snowplow via our webhook adapter so that you can use it alongside all of your other Snowplow data and, and you're not really stopping that customer journey at the install and then you're starting a new one from then onwards, but you can do all of your churn analysis or retention analysis or uh, conversion drivers or whatever you, you want to look at, you're doing that with regards to the attribution um, and with regards to the, the marketing channels so that you can really see the, the full picture. And we also have a, a guide on, on that, um, how to set up that third party integration. Uh, we'll be publishing that on, on our blog uh, either later this week or early next week. Um, so yeah, we can also link that already as a PDF in, in the, any follow-up that we do from this, this call. Thank you, Karen. Thanks again, Dana, for the question. I'm really pleased to have Hassan on the call with us as well. Uh, Hassan, you sent um, a great question over. It's a bit of a two-parter. If you wouldn't mind uh, introducing us to, to where you're joining us from and, and to your question, Hassan. Yes, sure. First of all, thank you everyone for inviting us all here. I am Hassan Chaukat and I am a data analyst at Hofner Mobilgesellschaft in Berlin. And we have been using Snowplow for around six months or more. Uh, we are maturing on things although i am not um uh, quite aware of more of the javascript sort of technicalities i'm more into analytics so um i did uh, was interested in uh, your customer stitching possibilities the most and i saw uh, uh, some forums or blog posts about even that yali did and yali said that we can stitch customer logged off customer events to logged in customer events uh, within the same cookie and we can stitch multiple cookies that belong to the same logged in user id that was quite easily understandable and then i also saw a, um, a berlin meetup of snowflow on youtube and they had a very great explanation about further customer searching possibilities based on the uh, specific business use case but then I often ask myself that, for example, if I'm stitching users, um, different users as being one, as uh, if a user has deleted his browser cookie and became a new cookie and has not logged in, or maybe if a user has a desktop and a mobile device, and I'm guessing based on some deterministic approach that these might be the same users, so what, how could I validate my guesses? Because uh, one thing's for sure that we don't have an absolute truth to compare our assumptions or guesses to, but what could be a fairly uh, practical approach to at least, uh, first of all, uh, persuade ourselves that our assumptions were more towards being correct and we could uh, justify ourselves and to others that the majority customers we are stitching would be correctly stitched. Yes, um, I can I can take this one as well. Um, so I think, um, yeah, maybe I can give a, a little intro to the topic first and then we can dive more specifically into your, your question around um, more kind of 
guesstimating of, of users than, than really stitching. But um, I think the, the main idea behind the way Snowplow tracks users is that there's two types where we think tracking more is better than uh, tracking less, and that's with timestamps and that's with user identifiers. So out of the box on the different platforms, uh, Snowplow collects a lot of different uh, user identifiers. Um, so on web, we have uh, the domain session ID, uh, the domain user ID, the network user ID, uh, the custom user ID, the IP address, um, and then um, on mobile, uh, we also have a, a custom user ID and obviously the, the mobile identifiers, IDFA, IDFE, or um, Android, IDFA, or AAID uh, uh, on Android. Um, and the idea really there is like before you, when you start diving into the topic of, of user stitching, the first thing that we think is important to do is kind of take stock of how these different IDs are performing uh, compared to what you would expect. So for example, um, if you have set up your collector uh, to be a subdomain of your domain, then the network user ID, which is a, a cookie ID set server side by the collector, um, will be a first party server side set cookie. And that means it will be unaffected by rulings like ITP um, versus the domain user ID, which is set uh, by the uh, client side against the domain that the tracking is on, that will be affected by ITP, even though it is a first party cookie. And so if you're running on the same, um, if all of your tracking is running on the same uh, root domain, you can, you should, you should be able to assume that for a given network user ID, there should be only, uh, there can be maybe multiple domain user IDs, but for a given domain user ID, there should never be more than one network user ID. And so you can test this, and like that's like the the kind of testing we will probably also recommend once we move into the more. Um, more abstract or and more complex user stitching uh, questions is always first defining what assumptions do I have about every user identifier or every combination of user identifiers I have and then can I verify these assumptions in my data set so if I'm saying I think that the network user ID is first party because I've set up because I've set my collector domain to be a, a subdomain of um, my main domain then I should only ever have one network user ID per domain user ID. If that's not the case in my data, then that assumption is incorrect. Then I need to go back to my tracking setup. I need to go back to my collective setup and see why that's not happening. Um, and maybe I need to, for those specific events, I need to look at the user agents. Is there any bots in there? Is that like, could that be, do I need to exclude these events from my main stitching because otherwise it will mess everything up because I have a few that aren't conforming to the assumptions. Um, so that's kind of the first thing we would recommend. Um, and then based on that, we would recommend to build a hierarchy. So once you've basically validated your assumptions and understood how effective are the different identifiers that I have, uh, given my setup, um, then you can say, well, actually, this is the hierarchy. So if we have a login on our website, um, then obviously probably the logged in user ID is the highest in the hierarchy. And then I will say, okay, for any given logged in ID, I'm going to collect all of the identifiers that possibly I can find in my data set. And there might be multiple network user IDs and multiple domain user IDs and multiple mobile IDs as people sign on on different devices. Um, and then you might say, well, actually, once I've done that, I can also start looking at for a given uh, logged in user, can I see any patterns in, for example, if I combine user agent plus IP address? Of course, that's when you start to move into realms where like you can't be sure because if you have lots of people sitting in the office, everybody's same IP, everybody's same same user agent, then that's not necessarily like a, a clear way. But again, like starting with the ID that you're really, really sure about, testing your assumptions there for any sort of more non-deterministic um, uh, identification can then help you extrapolate, well, once I take this type of identification onto my entire sample, do I have any sort of understanding as to how well it would perform then? Um, is, is, is probably the way we would recommend uh, going about this. Um, but really like the, the, course, the course steps are first defining um, all the different user identifiers you have, make, writing down the assumptions you have about those, verifying those assumptions in your data set by comparing them, um, then uh, building a hierarchy based on the assumptions that you've verified. And then once you have that hierarchy within the sets where you know, check any sort of combinations of other fields that you think might be potential identification solutions. Uh, and if they apply there within reasonable degree of confidence, then you can say, well, we can widen them out to, to users that, for example, are logged in and then not logged in um, and, and make a guess there as well. 
um, that's probably the process we would recommend. Um, and again, we have uh, some docs around this for um, that we can send out after. We'll, we'll be linking all of this stuff in, I don't know, however Steve will do the follow up. Um, and we also have a, a more uh, concrete uh, summary of the exact, all the different identified snowplow captures and what they mean, because obviously given all the changes in ITP and everything, a lot of these identifiers have changed. So previously, we've always thought of the network user ID as a third party cookie ID that helps you stitch users across different domains. But as kind of the third party cookie becomes more and more meaningless, actually more customers or, and, and more users of Snowplow are switching to using that uh, identifier um, as a first party server side set cookie to get around things like ITP. Uh, again, with the idea that you know, Snowplow is not a third party tracking solution. Snowplow is not about following people around on the internet. Uh, it's really there for companies to understand how their users are attracting on, on their site. Um, and that's also why we are able to offer solutions like this that, that circumvent these um, restrictions because these restrictions aren't really targeted at uh, solutions like, like Snowplow. Any questions on that? I know that was a long-winded answer. <laughs> No, it was a very good explanation and uh, I was um, partly trying that uh, from the beginning. I was uh, analyzing and observing different uh, um, matching or distributions of how which things related to one or more which things and it was I was drowned in that. So I still have to uh, dig into the technicalities of a lot of our identifiers as well and I'll carry on that, I'll carry that on. Awesome, yeah. And if once you're at a certain place, always feel free to, to reach out and, and share where you've got to, and we're happy to make suggestions. Okay. Thank you, Cara. Thank you, Hassan. Um, I have to apologize to Jao Carrera. Jao sent us a, a great question over the, the form in advance, but um, uh, Jao's out in the US, and, and we wanted to shift the time zone to, to make sure that Hassan and Rob could join us today um, for their questions as well. Um, Zhao asked a question about igloocentral.com and why it was outdated. If you're not familiar with it, um, it's a, a list of all the schemas that are available on igloocentral.com. To be honest, when I asked the team, um, hey, how come this is updated? <laughs> They, they were surprised to see that the page was even out there and we, we'd kind of forgotten that it, it had existed which is why it was outdated good news is it has been but um, it also started the question of you know what is this how could it be used so we'll we'd love to have that question next time Zhao, and to, to welcome you onto the next uh, ask labs anything cool and we can talk a little bit more about how how you're using it and and how we might be able to make uh, make it better for you so thank, thank you very much, Cara, for your answers to those questions. We were aware that with the questions that came in, it turned in very much to an Ask Cara anything session. Um, and, uh, and always internally, I, I think if I, if, I, uh, if I can't get the answer to something from Cara, then Josh is probably the person that, that can cover off the rest. Um, so I'm glad that we've got Josh here to talk to a question that we've had over the Q&A. Thank you, Trung, for your question. Um, we use an AWS Scala EMR Redshift pipeline. What are the advantages of using GCP uh, for my next project? Is GCP better for real-time streaming analysis? Um, Josh, can you answer that one? I can, I can. Um, so start off with the current AWS pipeline uh, and especially loading into Redshift or Snowflake DB still requires batch. Um, that's an inherent advantage in GCP, which is that we've done away with the batch system entirely. So you can take advantage of not only, you know, big query and that kind of infinite scale of that system, but as well, you can stream the data in real time to big query. So if you're looking at, you know, being able to model data much faster, being able to access the data in that warehouse much faster, um, there's a huge advantage there. The other big advantage is kind of in the architecture overall. So with batch processes, you've got kind of inherent, inherent complexity and inherent difficulty in managing varying loads in traffic. With streaming tech that auto scales, no matter what your ingress rates are, the pipeline will scale automatically. Data flow that kind of runs the different consumers can scale automatically. The collectors scale automatically. PubSub is fully elastic. That's the kind of connecting piece between these apps. So you never have to worry about my traffic shifted. I need to now scale up all these components. If you think about the batch process in AWS, you've got exactly that problem. If you have a large spike in traffic, um, Kinesis needs to be scaled up manually. 
your EMR process, your spec for that EMR cluster needs to be changed manually as well. We've actually got a whole support team built around those difficulties and that we need to manage those and scale those systems um, often not, not completely autonomously. So that's, that's kind of the biggest advantage is just there's no overhead to changes in traffic and you can really focus on just working with the data in BigQuery. The big caveat, however, is in how you access the data in, in BigQuery. So whereas in Redshift, you pay for your cluster, that's, that's your cost. You've got your cluster cost, it's a known cost, it's a fixed cost. That is much easier to reason about and much easier to deal with over time. Um, you can reserve that instance, you can manage that cost really well. BigQuery, you don't have that, but you pay for how much data you scan instead. So how you model that data has to be very careful. How you access the data has to be very careful. If you are gonna run data modeling processes um, using things like incremental models or making sure that you've got quite strict scan limits is very, very important to make sure you don't blow, um, blow your budget on, on querying, uh, querying the data. Um, there's been a follow-up question. Is it possible in the GCP world to have real-time dashboards as they come in? Um, yes, technically, technically, yes. So with the GCP pipeline, um, assuming everything's been set up correctly, um, you can kind of expect data to land in a couple of seconds um, from kind of collector to big query, the data is there. Dashboarding um, obviously then is requiring you to scan that data. So you can do real-time dashboards, you'll be paying for it though. So I guess the recommendation there would be that you do have a data modeling process still, or your real-time dashboard is very heavily limited on how much data you're scanning, but you don't want to be constantly pulling data from BigQuery. Um, so that's, that's kind of the, the balance that you've got to have. Um, obviously on smaller amounts of data, this won't be an issue. Um, and equally, you can also run your data modeling process very aggressively on very short amounts of data to build that real-time dashboard that then won't cost a lot of money to, to visualize and use. Thank you, Josh. Um, Hassan, I see your question. Um, we can absolutely provide a video of this after the session. Um, we, we plan to do that. We'll, we'll post it um, on Discourse afterwards. Uh, cool. So uh, we have another question that's come in. Um, it's from Mike, uh, Michael Poplin. Uh, what are the thoughts on putting the JavaScript tracker on a diet? I love the phrase. <laughs> um, it's getting increasingly large and not all the features are still required. And uh, seeing that question come in, I've actually bumped another snowplow that we had on the call, Paul, uh, up to a panelist so he can answer that question. Because I know it's something hey, Paul. to be looking at. Uh, Paul, Hi. quick intro to you, please, and, and if you could pick up that question, that'd be great. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm one of the engineers at Snowplow, and particularly um, one of the core maintainers of the JavaScript um, tracker. So hopefully have a reasonable answer to this one. Um, yes, we would very much like to put it on a diet. It has got, uh, so I, I joined uh, Snowplow about eight months ago, and it's been on my radar um, as, a, as a wider JavaScript tracker improvement um, that we want to make. Um, and part of that is, is yes, yeah, slimming it down a little bit. So it's got to about 100 kilobytes in terms if it's not like gzipped. So um, it's quite big. Uh, I generally advise uh, gzipping it uh, if you're storing it on your own CDN or something. I think that cuts it down to about 25, 30 kilobytes in terms of uh, traffic, uh, sort of egress from, from your CDN. So that'll save some costs. But yeah, it is pretty, um, it's pretty chunky. So one of the one of the things we're looking at in the nearish future um, is to uh, rethink um, the build process of the JavaScript tracker. So we're going to throw away Gulp, which is um, rather old, and switch to Rollup.js. And we're also going to um, rethink how we structure it. So we're probably going to bring TypeScript um, into it as a more first party uh, language and drop a lot of the standard JavaScript. Um, think about sort of new minification options. My initial tests, I have a a running like alpha release sort of of, of this um, improvement and it roughly gets it down to about seven, 60, 70 kilobytes depending on what I chop out. What we're also investigating is whether we can take out some of the um, auto contexts um, like Optimizely for instance, not everybody needs Optimizely. So we're thinking is there a way of, of extracting that out and making it like a plugin. So there's like this interface that you can plug in new 
auto context generation. If you don't need them, that means you don't have to load them, right? So, and that's going to give, and that should lead to considerable savings. And then all of that's bundled in with the idea of it becoming a, an NPM package as well. So um, directly, you can directly integrate it into your React or Angular applications. Um, and again, then it'll be minified as part of your application. So it'll, it'll be bundled in as part of your app, but we'll still have the, the usual um, snippet version of, of the tracker as well. So that'll still exist with the sim similar or same API as what's currently out there. Um, so, so yeah, so there's quite a lot of things that are in, in flight and that are, we're thinking about right now in terms of improvement and underpinning all of that really is, is one of the goals is to make it substantially smaller or, or make more of it like customizable so you can drop bits out of it if you don't need those, those bits of the tracker. Thanks, Paul. And that's, that's part of a bigger program of work that I mentioned before across our, uh, our main trackers and across the iOS and Android trackers as well. All of them are getting a lot more care this year than they, they've had previously. Um, and we're lo looking to try and decouple the layers within the trackers as well, make it a lot clearer where, where we are going to put new functionalities. It's not quite as knitted in as it has been previously and make it altogether a, a clearer and safer um, platform to contribute to. So do keep an eye out for the, the improvements that we're making across the tracker estate. Um, and we're looking forward to, to your contributions. I, I can't remember if I mentioned at the top of the call that we are taking questions on the Q&A. So if you do have any further questions, please do put them in there. Um, Cara, uh, did, you, did you have something to add on the last question? Did you want to add it now? Sorry, the, the one before the, the JavaScript tracker one. I think I moved on too quickly. Um, that's okay. Uh, I was just gonna add, if you're looking at doing a kind of real-time dashboarding um, and you have an, an AWS pipeline set up, um, it might also be worth looking at Elasticsearch and Kibana. Um, that's a great place to easily get a kind of dashboard set up where you can say how many people are currently on my website or how many people are currently reading X, Y, or Z. Um, so I think if, if you are on the AWS stack <clears throat> and you want to, to use that in a more real-time fashion, uh, setting up Elasticsearch can be great. We have an uh, Elasticsearch loader uh, there. Um, and then of course, like if you want to look at more proper real-time analytics, um, probably also at some point moving to the, the streams directly. So Kinesis or PubSub on GCP um, will, be, will be a good idea. Um, as Josh mentioned, on BigQuery, you just have that cost element of scanning the same data again and again. And even with, with data modeling, that, that can be expensive. So I think really, if you're looking at, at real time, probably like Elasticsearch and, and all the, the streams directly are a better option than, than BigQuery. Yeah. One, one tiny word of caution on Elasticsearch is that storing any large amounts of data there will get very expensive very, very quickly. Um, so, you know, that's, that's another trade-off there. You can get it in um, in real time, but storing large amounts for historical analysis is not going to be um, cost friendly. Cool, thank you. Um, thanks for that addition, Cara uh, and, and Josh. Uh, we have a question, sorry to bounce around. Like we, we wanted to keep this kind of informal and I think we're doing an expert job of doing that. So I'm gonna go back to the JavaScript <laughs> um, question. And uh, Rob, I think you had a, a follow up to that. Did you want to ask your question? Yeah, sure. So um, one of the things with the JavaScript tracker is that uh, a lot of the, the uh, all, a lot of the cookies for uh, domain session ID domain user ID uh, and all of that is set using um, a key like underscore SP dot uh, and then you've got like a bit of a hash digest. So the, the cookies are set on, on, the, on the domain using a hash digest function, like the, the, the digest from a hash function and the, the hash function is actually quite large. I'm not actually sure uh, what purpose the hash function um, serves in storing the cookies and whether or not that uh, removing that large hash function from the JavaScript tracker could actually save a lot of the, the weight inside the JavaScript tracker as well. Yeah, so there's, um, so the, I think part of the reason it's there, um, so maybe part, it's partially legacy, right? I think there's some of that knocking about in the JavaScript tracker. We made some decisions um, a while back for certain reasons that may maybe don't apply so much anymore, um, but they're still there. 
um, because we haven't bumped the major version of the JavaScript tracker for a while now and changing the the cookie name would be a huge breaking change, right? It would invalidate every like stored domain user ID and, and we'd lose them all fundamentally. And so everyone's user ID, so suddenly every user accounts would spike really, really suddenly and um, because they, we generate a lot of new domain user IDs. Um, they, there's a couple of things that are probably worth mentioning as part of the rewrite that um, I briefly mentioned ver earlier, that will be a bump to version three. Um, so there will be a major release when we do that rewrite. This gives me the opportunity to reevaluate a lot of um, some, well, not a lot of, but some of these decisions that we made, um, particularly around the libraries that we're pulling in um, to, to calculate. Um, so we re I recently ripped out one of the cookie libraries um, and we, did it natively in the tracker. Um, so there was a, trying to remove some of those dependencies would be, would be nice. Um, I'm not saying they're all gonna go and what decisions we're gonna make, um, but that is, I think what you've suggested is certainly an option um, to remove the, um, the, that large library. Um, so, so yeah, the, we'll make these choices. And I think the other option is to make it more of a configurable option, right? So it's sort of, try and work out if there's a way we can structure it. So if you don't want to pull the library in, you don't have to, and therefore you don't get the hashing bit of the, um, on the cookie name, um, but then just being aware that if there's historic reasons behind that, then you're gonna, they're gonna have, you know, or you've got historical domain user IDs, you're gonna lose those. And when you make this upgrade, and but give the people that are using the JavaScript tracker that, that flexibility and that customization. Um, if I'm entirely honest, I don't know the history of that hash. So I don't actually know why it's there on the end of that um, the name. Um, I assume it's there for some sort of collision reason around different domains. Um, lost, when... lost in the midst of time, I think, Paul. Yeah, I think there's a few things that are lost in the midst of time. Um, someone pointed out to me that there's uh, there's two billions the other day. There's force secure tracker and force insecure tracker. Um, a force insecure tracker just seems completely pointless now because if you turned it on, the tracker just wouldn't work because all websites are HTTPS, right? So like these like little things, these are the things that will rip out in version three, which will help me slim it down a little bit, right? Um, so so yeah, there's a few things like this that we're going to try and try and get get out of get out of the way so we can we have a new playing field and a, and a new place to start from. Also, it makes it easy to contribute to, right? Because the code base will hopefully be a bit cleaner. Yeah. Oh, looking forward to that. Be following you know, on GitHub. Cool. Uh, I think there's actually someone on the call who can explain some of the history there. Uh, Cole, I'm going to um, see if I can allow you to talk. Cole, can you talk now? Uh, I don't know. Is this working? It is working. Go for it. Hey, hey Cole. Hey. Uh, so I think I know why that hash was introduced in the first place, which might be interesting. Um, so I believe it was down to um, an issue we found with some of our customers where essentially the cookie values were being interfered with, which was very confusing. Um, but it, it, I think it turned out to be the case that there was a third party like plugin that they were using for some other, some other type of tracking reason on the same domain. Um, and uh, essentially, essentially one tracker that they used Snowplow tracking embedded in whatever that extension was. Um, and essentially, essentially one of the trackers would interfere with the cookie values of the other. Um, so that was introduced to ensure that uh, basically any, any instance of the tracker doesn't interfere with another instance of the tracker in the same, in the same, uh, in the same domain. Cool. Thank you very much, Colm. Uh, I'm going to uh, leave that as it is because I don't know how to turn it off. Cool. Let's move on. Uh, real professional outfit we got here. <laughs> um, Mike's found the Q&A. Mike, we've got loads of questions from you. I, I think they're all from you. I can it, it sound that they're all from you. But we'll pick up a couple of them with the time that we've got left. Um, I'll take uh, one of them. Is the atomic events refactor still on the timeline for Redshift? Um, should we rethink the data models in the Snowflake and BigQuery at the same time? Um, I'll take the first part of that question, which the atomic events refactor. I mentioned, you know, failed events, something we've been looking 
uh, at for a long time, work on a long time. Uh, I think we're probably just going to take a moment. We're going to take a breath after that one. And then Atomic Inventory Factory is still the one that we, we, we it's kind of the one that we see as the next the next big refactor we can do. And we think it will be very similar to the failed events one and that it's going to touch um, so many parts of the, the pipelines. Um, but uh, yeah, I think we, we want to kind of learn the lessons from failed events and see how we can deliver that one um, in a different way. So probably a watching brief on, on failed events. We'll come back to that one at, at a later date. And there's a question that I think, Alex, you might be a, a good person to talk to. Another one from Mike. Um, will we ever get rid of thrift and replace it with something that's a little easier to parse and tools like BigQuery, Athena, etc.? That's an, that's an interesting question. I mean, I think... Oh, to go back to, so, so for anyone who's, who's not up to speed on this, um, so Thrift is the, the, the format we use for the kind of the, the raw events, so the, um, the, the payload that gets written after the collector and gets fed into the, um, the, the enrichment process. Um, yeah, I can talk to this because I, I, <laughs> it happened on my watch, I guess. So, um, so why do we choose Thrift? So the, the field was quite open when we chose Thrift. Um, there was Thrift, there was like, Protocol buffers were quite new. Avro wasn't as dominant as it is now. Um, and I think we chose Thrift for a couple of reasons. One was that it was quite lightweight. And the second was that it had the, the most language support. So we were like, oh, well, you know, if we choose Thrift, then people could write a, 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 pro, a downstream process in any language. And actually kind of that, that turned out not to be necessary, right? So like the, 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 the core consumer, the primary consumer of the raw events is, is the snowplow enrichment and, and validation process and so actually having like you know making it super easy for lots of different things to to consume um uh the thrift payload was, wasn't wasn't has never turned out to be, be be very important i think that where this question is probably coming from is like it's quite useful though to be able to sort of dive into those raw events when you're trying to do diagnostics and understand what's going wrong maybe you've got like validation problems or whatever and it's it's a little bit unwieldy working with thrift so I think, um, like, I can't, I can't speak to kind of uh, where it, where it sits on the roadmap, but it's both, it, it is possible to change it because it's not used by a lot of downstream systems. We'd have to change it in the collectors. We have to change it in the enrichment process. It just hasn't been a super, super high priority thing to do. Um, but yeah, because there aren't lots of downstream consumers, it's not a super complex thing to do, but it would change. Um, it would, of course, change people's historic archives of their raw events um so that's just something to bear in mind um yeah so that was a bit of a ramble but um but but interesting question thank you very much alex uh i'm getting thoroughly confused by the questions coming in from lots of different directions <laughs> um on the ah uh here's one from an anonymous attendee are there any guides for deploying snowplow on gcp Uh, do you want me to answer that one? Yeah, go for it, Paul. Um, so we recently um, have migrated a lot of our old documentation um, on GitHub, where it's still a lot of it's still there, uh, but we're slowly uh, finishing this off. But there's a new documentation website um, called docs.snowplowanalytics.com. Um, you may have been there uh, in the last like 12 months, but we've just rebuilt it again. Um, so there's a, a new version. And um, on that new version is uh, a much more detailed, complete guide to how to deploy on GCP. Um, it's effectively a first party platform now, just like the AWS guide and um, that you will find on GitHub. So docs.snowplowanalytics.com and you'll find the setup guide for GCP on there, um, which is which is uh, step by step on GCP. Um, so much easier to follow um, than previous. If I remember correctly, I think um, Seema Harva did a great um, setup on GCP. It, it might be a bit dated now. I think it was right after we, we released it um, last December. Yeah, so um, the December blog post is pretty accurate still. Um, there's one or two little things that have changed, but I think with those two resources, Simon's blog post and the new doc site, then you should be able to deploy to GCP uh, without much hassle now. Great. We're, we're about up to time. All, all of the questions that we've had uh, posted in the, the Q&A, um, we will build into the next one. I want to make sure that we take the opportunity at the end of this call to thank everyone for coming and joining us today. 
Um, thank you to, to Rob, Dana, Hassan, and, and Jao for your questions in advance. Uh, Trung, Mike, um, for your, your questions as we were going through. It's been a really fun session. Uh, it's been great to learn how to use Zoom uh, live. <laughs> Uh, let's see webinars live and, and hopefully everything recorded okay. Um, thank you to everyone who did come and, and join us live and thank you to everyone who, who has downloaded this after and, and listened to it back. Um, do you keep an eye out for the next one? I've actually seen one uh, question come through live on the, the form that we put out before in discourse um, as we've been talking, which is great. We'll try and roll that into the next, um, into the next session. The, the details of the form are on, uh, are on discourse. I'll post them again after this and, and bump them to the top of the lists. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for everyone for joining us. Joining us. Thank you to everyone from uh, Snowplow Answer the Questions. Uh, yeah, uh, join us next time. Thank you very much. You can say Thanks, bye, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye.